Good morning, everyone. This is George Spies with the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records. And welcome to this morning's webinar. Where we're going to be talking about the right to know law and the payment issues uh, uh, side of, of this law. A um, couple of preliminaries before we get started. First is that um, this presentation is based on a PowerPoint uh, deck and if you would like a copy of that, you can find it on our website. Uh, go over to the training tab, scroll down, and uh, you'll find all of the PowerPoints that we use for our training, including all of these webinars. You're welcome to download them and use them as you see fit, maybe just for uh, uh, your own future reference. Perhaps you had a colleague or friend who couldn't attend today, and uh, they might find it helpful. Also, if you're doing any localized training, you can use any of our resources uh, to help you out with that. Also, this record or this uh, session is being recorded, and uh, usually what happens is uh, a couple days after the presentation, uh, the recording gets cleaned up, loaded to our YouTube channel, and then a link is established from our web page to the YouTube channel. So you'll find the most recent recordings for each one of these topics, again, on our website under the training tab. Same conditions exist, you know, if you uh, would find it helpful to refer back to the recording. Uh, some people like to have that link. Uh, other people, uh, like I said, they have colleagues or friends who couldn't attend today and they just think it would be helpful for them to sit and listen to the uh, recording and uh, that's fine too. And again, if you're conducting any localized training and our office isn't able to help you out directly, you can certainly use our recording uh, to do that. Um, you'll be able to uh, ask questions during this session using the chat feature. Type them in the chat feature. They'll show up on my screen here. And I will do my best to answer them live as we're going through the presentation. Uh, but I would ask uh, two things. First is we're talking about the right to know law and payment issues. So let's stay on topic. And uh, more importantly is uh, the, your questions, uh, the better. Occasionally folks will uh, type in, you know, it seems like pages. And it's just very awkward for me to sit here and read through all of that uh, while everyone else is waiting patiently. What, what we'll do is that uh, if you have something that's unusually complex, or particularly unique to your situation, we'll take the conversation, we'll either take it offline and you can reach out to the office or I'll do my best to come back to it at the end of the presentation if it looks like it's something that everyone might benefit from and uh, I'll do my best to answer the question. Uh, when you do reach out to our office, the contact information is on the screen right now, the, the central office phone number and the URL for our website on the website, you'll find email accounts where you can uh, uh, send in your questions as well. What happens is it comes into one of our admin staff. They're pretty well versed on the right to know law. I mean, uh, you know, we've seen it all here, uh, at least, you know, until tomorrow. And um, they'll do their best to answer your questions. If you should happen to stump them, then we'll escalate your, uh, your query up to one of our senior staff and they're pretty good at getting back to you usually within 24 hours. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, things are just really busy here lately. We're breaking all kinds of records for uh, requests and appeals and so forth that we're getting. Uh, they're steadily increasing staff, but it seems like just when we get somebody new on board, uh, you know, the levels go up even further. Uh, so, yeah, it seems like the right to know law is very popular in Pennsylvania lately. And uh, it may take longer than 24 hours for them to get back to you. But, you know, we're doing our best here uh, to try and help you out. We figure if you're contacting us, chances are it's, it's something important and it's something that's time sensitive. So we're going to do our best to get you steered in the right direction. OK, so I think that covers all the preliminaries. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the presentation and why I think that uh, the whole payment issue side of the right to know law is often misunderstood because people think it's free when in fact it's not, uh, both agencies and requesters. And, um, and some of the issues that we can address 
uh, looking at the payment side of the right to note law. Okay, um, hold on a second. No. Hold on, folks. I got to mute um, an unusual set of circumstances here. All right, I'm back. That was kind of weird. Um, the office is empty today. I'm the only one here because of a conference. And there was a police officer pounding on the door, uh, submitting some paperwork. So I took it on his behalf. But you don't care about that. You just care about the webinar. That was kind of strange. OK. Uh, you're going to find information about uh, the fee schedule. Um, it's in the law itself, section 1307, and it authorizes the Office of Open Records to establish a fee schedule. Um, it's posted on our website, and it's reviewed every two years, meaning that uh, the public and agencies are given the opportunity to weigh in on if they think you know, some fees are too high, some fees are too low, um, and they can submit their comments. We are currently in one of those periods so that uh, if you uh, are a requester or an agency and you have concerns or you have suggestions, now's the time to contact the Office of Open Records and let us know what your thoughts are. And I can tell you personally that we have changed the fee schedule as a result of input. So, you know, it's not just uh, a simple exercise, okay? Um, basically, it's, you can, an agency is permitted to charge up to 25 cents a page, single-sided, black and white, eight and a half by 11, eight and a half by 14. If by chance it should be color, that goes up to 50 cents a page. All other sizes are the actual cost. And what that refers to is something like blueprints. Um, let's say that the agency doesn't have a large scale copier, so they have to go down the street to um, uh, Kinko's or maybe an architectural firm or whatever to get a copy of a blueprint made. And they're gonna charge you 10, 12 bucks. Well, if you can document that cost, then you can pass that on to the requester as an actual cost, okay? And then here's one of the changes that was made, I think the last cycle that uh, when we reviewed the fee schedule is that if you get a particularly large response in excess of a thousand pages, and this does happen um, periodically, like here's an example, PennDOT, when they're looking at a right of way issue, um, an environmental group will sometimes come in and request all of the documentation. And those responses can exceed a thousand pages. Well, when it gets above a thousand pages, um, the fee per page drops to 20 cents, not the 25. Okay, for anything above a thousand. Now, you see in red here at the bottom of the slide, read the footnotes, okay? This is very important. Along with the right to know law itself, there is case law, meaning that appeals have gone before the courts, uh, county courts, then it goes to the Commonwealth Court, then it goes up to the all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. You know, that possibility exists. They will issue opinions deciding these appeals, oftentimes with the language in there that proves very useful in how we apply the right to know law. 
including payment issues. Okay, so there's there is a body of case law that has uh, clarified thoughts on how we pay for the right to know law. And you're gonna find references to those in the footnotes, okay? So when you look at this fee schedule that's posted on our website, don't forget to go down and read the fine print because oftentimes if you encounter an issue where you know this just doesn't make sense in how we charge for this particular circumstance, there's a chances are it's been dealt with before the courts have weighed in, or maybe it was just a ruling from our office has weighed in. And um, uh, you know the the footnotes explain it. Okay, now I see that uh, questions are popping up on a different screen here. Okay, so let me just refer to this. Can a requester ask for the printing be double sided? And uh, now it just disappeared. Okay, I'm going to try and um, change my chat feature because I noticed this was working kind of weird this morning. I'm going to come in and out of chat, and hopefully these questions are going to pop up. And oh, it's this new system which I do not like, and I'm telling the world that. OK, um, I think I'm going to have trouble with the chat features this morning. And if I caught that um, question as it popped up on my laptop here, can a requester ask for double sided? Uh, it, I think you can, but you're still going to pay for the 25 cents per page single sided um, and, and you would you're not going to save any money asking for double-sided copying is, is I guess what the question is. They, if it's double-sided, they can charge you per side the 25 cents uh, because basically you're paying for the paper and the, the copier toner is what it comes down to. So double-sided, you're using twice as much toner. That's what you're going to end up paying for. So, you know, it's up to you. If you want to save paper, uh, that's, you know, that's great but I think you're still going to end up paying 50 cents per page for the double sided. Interestingly, I don't think that has ever been litigated. I don't think there's any case law on that issue. Um, yeah, racking my brain here. I can't think of anything, but I, I believe that's where you're going to end up at. Okay. So yeah, read the footnotes and hopefully that will uh, provide clarification on the uh, fee schedule. OK, I already mentioned one example of pass through costs, and that was the large scale copying. You know, if you have to go outside of your agency or if by chance, um, you know, you have like a copier contract where you can actually document how much it costs to produce a large scale copy, then, yeah, you can pass that on as well. Um, but actual costs are those which are incurred that can be documented and then passed on to the requester. Uh, postage is another good example. The scenario might be that someone submits a right to know request for printed copies of a public record. Uh, you assemble those copies. Uh, you've already worked out, you know, how payment is going to occur and so forth. Uh, and you provide an invoice. Well, and and finally, the person wants the copies mailed back to them. So you take all the copies. Uh, put them on your postage meter. It says, for instance, it's going to cost $3.15 to mail these out. So you can add that $3.15 to your invoice because it is an actual documented cost. Okay. Um, copies of analog recordings. You know what? I know very few agencies that are still using cassette tapes. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think you can imagine, you know, you, you pay for the cost of the cassette tape. And if you have to, you know, outsource the recording uh, to make the copy, you can charge that. Uh, most agencies have gone to some sort of digital format where they're using, you know, you, know, you can use a smartphone nowadays. Uh, uh, and then we have storage media like flash drives. Uh, if If someone is requesting a large, body of electronic records that uh, exceed 
the threshold that your email system allows for sending and say that you want to provide the electronic records on a flash drive, you can charge for the cost of the flash drive because you know the agency had to go out and buy it. Uh, but there is a solution for that, and I want to address that right now. Um, now, this is not in the right to know law. I wanna make this clear. There's nothing in the law that says you have to do this. But several years ago, uh, we were approached by, well, actually a couple agencies over the flash drive issue, and they told us this is what we're doing uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, it, it's just easier. It saves a lot of work. Number two, our information technology, our computer security guys, girls, were, uh, I guess I shouldn't say um, female workers, were concerned over security issues with introducing a flash drive into our computer network because of fears of malware or viruses being uh, 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 now entered into our network that could cause all kinds of problems. So we don't want outside flash drives. So what they started doing is telling people that if you want these large electronic files, you have to provide us with an unopened new flash drive. Okay, so that takes care of one side of the virus concern. Plus now the agencies don't have to go out and buy flash drives and uh, require reimbursement for them. Okay, so it, it removes that whole dynamic. And then what the agencies are doing is they're identifying the responsive files transferring them to a laptop and then disconnecting the laptop from the network. Then they plug in the unopened uh, flash drive and transfer the files over so that if by chance there is a, uh, a virus on the flash drive, the software, the virus software on the laptop picks it up without any chance of it going over into the agency's network because the flash drive or the uh, laptop is now standalone. Okay, so you see how all that works. Um, we are only putting it out there as a best practice that maybe an agency, if you're here from an agency today, you want to consider. Um, there's not, like I said, there's nothing in the right to know law that says this is what you must do. It's just that when we get, you know, when when people tell us about these new ideas, we take a look at it and think, hey, you know, this makes a lot of sense. So it's what we do here at our office, and uh, you're welcome to uh, try it out yourselves, and see how it works for you. All right, so let's move on and talk about what you cannot charge for under the right to know law. And the first is employee labor, whether it's like an hourly fee or a fixed fee. Every so often, uh, we'll be reviewing agency websites. You know, we go out and kind of conduct an informal audit and we'll run across one where they say, you know, for all right to know responses, um, we're going to charge you, you know, uh, $10 an hour or, you know, maybe just a flat fee, $25 for all right to know responses. You know, that is uh, inconsistent with the right to know law. The, the, the right to know law is clear. You cannot charge for employee labor. It's simply considered the cost of the government doing business as you would for many other of the processes that you're responsible for. You can't charge for any sort of legal review, whether, whether it be your in-house counsel or an outside solicitor of any sort. Um, you can't assess a processing fee. Uh, meaning, just like I said, you know, all right to know responses are going to be $25. Every so often we see someone trying to charge what's called a redaction fee. Redactions are where you determine that the record is public, but there's some sensitive piece of data on there. Like maybe it's a social security number or a private phone number. Okay, so with a redaction, uh, you, you take uh, a Sharpie or whiteout or something, and you remove that sensitive piece of data and then you provide the record okay and 
And some agencies will attempt to say, if we have to do that, then we're going to charge you uh, an extra $10. You can't do that, okay? The law is very clear. No redaction fees. Then there's a thing called a scanning fee, okay? Now, agencies can charge for physical copies, paper copies, okay? So the question used to come up, we don't see this as much anymore. I think that's probably because of these webinars and agencies getting educated on the right to know law. But we would get emails or phone calls that say, you know, basically, look, it's the same amount of effort, the same amount of wear and tear on our copying device for me to scan records in as it is to make copies. Why can't we charge for scanning? And it's because the law says you can't. You cannot charge for electronic records. When you're scanning, that's basically what you're doing. You're creating an electronic record. But here's the thing, and we're going to talk about it in a slide coming up here, is that chances are you do not have to scan in the first place. And I'll explain that when uh, we get to that section of the presentation. Electricity, uh, yeah, believe it or not, I've had questions come in. Why can't we charge for electricity that it costs us for uh, creating copies? And my first question back to them is, okay, how are you going to calculate it? Um, and that pretty much ends the conversation. And then, like I said, you cannot charge for electronic records, which would be, you know, conceivably emails, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, various database files. If the end result is an electronic file uh, that the public record exists in, that you're providing it to the requester in electronic medium, then you cannot charge for it, okay? Now, here's an interesting point that uh, disputed fees can be appealed to the Office of Open Records, and periodically they are. Uh, and this is where uh, the agency is attempting to levy a fee for the right to know response, and the requester disagrees with that fee. Well, under the right to know law, that can be appealed, okay? Because the requester, from their perspective, is viewing it as a denial. So uh, where we're at here is there's a body of case law as well as final determinations, which for our purposes is case law because uh, our decisions carry the weight of law uh, that you can find on our website. It's uh, you would go to the appeals database and uh, it's searchable. So you can search using the term fees. And all of the decisions that have been rendered where there has been a dispute over fees will come up and it will, you know, it makes for some exciting reading, uh, but you can sit there and get a pretty clear understanding on how the Office of Open Records has ruled when there's been a dispute over the fees. So you know, bottom line is that if a requester disagrees, they can appeal uh, the dispute over fees. Okay, here's what I was talking about when it comes to scanning. If you go to section 701 of the uh, right to know law, I'll paraphrase here, but basically it says that the record shall be provided in the medium in which it exists. Okay, that essentially, when we use the term medium, we're talking about hard copy versus electronic records. So, Let's break this down and try and make sense of it using common English. Here's the scenario. Let's say that we're a local agency and we have a building permit process and it's all paper driven. OK, when someone requests a building permit, they apply using paper forms. The review process is entirely paper driven. And when there's an approval, uh, that uh, approval permit is paper. It goes out to the uh, developer, builder, homeowner, whomever, uh, uh, through the mail, on, and there's a hard copy permit that's issued. Okay, so someone, a requester, submits a right to know request, and let's say they do it by email because it's, it's easy and it's, we assume it's free, and they request the records electronically. Um, and they do that because, like I was saying earlier, there's no charge for electronic records. Okay, so um, the problem 
is that all of the building permit records are paper. So in order to meet the request, you would have to convert them over to electronic records by scanning them in. That's the only way you could really do it. Well, because all the records are paper, and because we have this language in Section 701, you do not have to scan the records in because that would be converting them from hard copy to electronic. And Section 701 says you only need to provide the records in the medium in which they exist. Okay, you follow me on that? So in this particular scenario, the agency's response would be, we do have those records. We've determined that they are public. However, they're hard copy. We're willing to provide them to you in hard copy medium, but that's going to cost you up to 25 cents a page. Okay, we are not obligated to scan them in. Now, this is outside of the law, but I'll just let you know that if you do want to scan them in, you can. It's just that then you can't charge for electronic records. Uh, for instance, our office usually will do that. For starters, most of our records are electronic. We just, our system is all electronically driven, uh, both you know off the website, the docketing system, and the other systems that we have. So usually when someone sends us a hard copy record, the first thing that happens is it gets scanned in. Uh, so we usually will provide all of our records in electronic medium to begin with. The other thing is that if it's not already scanned in, we will usually do that. And it's just easier to scan it in and send it off than it would be to, uh, you know, find the envelopes and, and postage and so forth and have the mailroom get involved. Um, so our office as a practice, if we could scan it in and send it to somebody, that's what we do. But you don't have to do that, okay? Uh, you can decide we're going to generate paper copies, but you have to pay for them, okay? Just make sure that they're willing to pay for them before you go through the exercise of actually making the paper copies. Uh, then we get into medium versus format, okay? And there's a difference. You know, medium is hard copy versus electronic. Format usually refers to uh, the computer software that's used to generate the electronic record. And this brings up an evolving area of case law that you should be aware of when it comes to Excel spreadsheets. It used to be, years ago that um, agencies were concerned over releasing Excel spreadsheets through the right to know because of a fear that number one, we're including the formulas that are behind each cell of an Excel spreadsheet. And the person could go in and alter those formulas and change the spreadsheet to misrepresent what we're providing, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you that in the 10 years I worked for, well, it was eight years actually, for the Office of Open Records as an employee, and now the last two years as a consultant, I am not aware of that ever happening. If it were, it would be an issue outside of the right to know law that the agency would deal with. Uh, but I don't know of anyone ever altering a record and saying, this is what the agency gave me. Okay, but let's get back to the point. Um, agencies in response to that would generate a PDF of the spreadsheet rather than provide the Excel spreadsheet itself. Okay, that got appealed and the court's position was, the purpose of the right to know law is to provide a copy of the public record. So the court said a PDF is in fact a copy. So that's acceptable. If someone requests an Excel spreadsheet, you can give them a PDF and you've met your obligation under right to know. Now this has evolved over the last 10 years. Where we're at now is that if someone specifically requests an Excel spreadsheet 
and they use the term Excel, then the agency must provide the actual spreadsheet, okay, um, formulas and all. However, if they simply say, I want a copy of the spreadsheet without mentioning Excel, then it's okay to give them a, PB, a PDF and uh, off you go, okay? Um, so that's where things are now. I don't necessarily see, you know, I, I'm not aware of any litigation in the, the pipeline that might change this, uh, but I, I think it emphasizes the point why if you are working with the right to know law, you got to stay up on the case law as well. Okay, just, you know, in, in our office, in uh, its website and other social media, we, we let you know when important decisions come out that can affect how you respond to right to know requests. And then finally, we get down to proprietary formats. This usually involves police departments, although I haven't seen it in a while, but a police department, you know, they might buy off the shelf software that you can only access the data if you have the software itself. And there is no way to generate reports as an ASCII file or um, you know, PDF or some other uh, typical public format. If that's the case, if it's all in-house where you can only read the data, if you have a copy of this customized software itself, then you're not under obligation to provide those copies um, simply because you don't have the technical resources to do so. Right. Uh, I haven't seen this in a couple of years, but we did run across it with uh, some of the uh, proprietary formats that were being used by police departments. And in one case, uh, a school district. OK. Um, all right. Moving on. Let me get a sip of coffee. Now, I mentioned earlier that you cannot assess a redaction fee. That doesn't necessarily mean that there can't be a cost associated with redactions, though. Now, I'll go back and define what a redaction is. The agency, in response to a right to know request, has determined that it is a public record, but there's some sensitive piece of data, for instance, like a social security number, that needs to be blacked out. So there's two ways to do this. If you have, uh, for instance, redaction software like the Adobe Office Suite, you take the electronic record, you load it into Adobe, and you can electronically and securely delete that sensitive piece of data. And then you now have a copy of the otherwise redacted public record, okay? The second way to do this is to print out the electronic record, take a Sharpie, or I'm told what works better is white out and white out the sensitive piece of data. Then you scan the document back in to create now a redacted, a, a manually redacted electronic record. If you do the manual redaction, you're allowed to charge for the piece of paper and the copier toner that you had to use to generate the hard copy record prior to redaction. Okay, so you can, in essence, assess a charge for redactions. So let me go off script here and go on a soapbox. The greater majority of people who use the right to know law are willing to pay a nominal fee for public records that they need to solve whatever problem they're dealing with. But I'm the first to acknowledge that there are a handful of people where, for whatever reason, the relationship has broken down with the agency. And when I use the term agency, that's generic. It could be a Commonwealth agency. It could be you know, a city, borough, township, school district charter school, whatever, okay? But one of the ways that they decided they're going to be a pain in the neck to that agency is through the right to know law. 
So they submit a lot of frivolous write no requests. Typically, they request electronic records because, again, it's free. However, my experience is that these people are not willing to pay to be a pain in the neck. So if you can come up with a means to assess a charge, redaction being one of them, um, maybe those people would balk at the idea of paying for that right to no response, and they're going to go away. Okay, I used the term maybe. In my experience, it's more like usually. Okay, very few people are willing to pay to be a pain in the neck when it comes to the right to know law. Okay, so you kind of see where I'm headed here. If you can come up with a way of assessing a charge that's valid, then it may solve your problems as far as these frivolous requests go. Now, here's the other thing. Again, we're looking at case law. As it stands right now, there is nothing in case law that says if you have redaction software, you must use it. Our office has, has issued a policy statement that says you should use it. It doesn't say you shall use it. OK, so there's a difference there. But we do want to warn you that the way the winds are currently blowing with the courts, we kind of suspect or expect within the next two years, the courts may weigh in on this issue and we will see language that says if you have redaction software, you must use it or you shall use it. OK, again, something just to kind of keep your, you know, your ear to the pavement with the case law. If it happens, we will let everybody know as best we can. Uh, but we kind of sense this is where the courts are heading. And within the next couple of years, uh, it's the result that we'll see. OK, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, inspections. OK, if you're familiar with the right to know law, you have two options. You can request copies or you can request to inspect the records. And that's where you come into the office uh, during business hours when it's convenient for them. They let you know when you can come in and you look at the actual records. Well, again, if you have to redact something and make a copy, you can charge for that person to come in and look at the redacted record that you had to create. OK, but just bear in mind, number one, let them know up front there's going to be a charge because they may, again, balk at that. So um, you don't want to be making copies that they're not going to pay for. But if they do agree to pay for it, the other thing is that when they have completed their inspection, you should give them those redacted copies because let's face it, they paid for them, okay? So they should be able to walk out of there with the copies that they paid for, all right? And then the other obligation, whether it's for an inspection or for copies, is that a redaction is a denial. You're basically saying, we're not letting you see this part of the public record. But what you do is tell them what's behind the redaction. And that may, you know, prevent them from filing an appeal. If you say, and legally you're supposed to do this anyway, when you provide your response, we're granting your record, but we want you to know that we've redacted part of it. And behind the redaction is a, is a social security number, which under the uh, social security code, we cannot, release okay that way they they know what you're hiding from them and they can say oh yeah that's understandable or you know maybe it could be a home phone number and uh based on the constitutional right for privacy we don't give out home phone numbers or personal email addresses things like that okay but understood understand that you can charge for redactions if these conditions have been met where you are in fact generating a paper copy and then scanning it back in, performing that manual redaction. Okay, what about actually charging fees? This is another interesting point and often misunderstood point of the right to know law. You've often heard me say that 
within the right to know law, there are hard deadlines with no wiggle room because the courts have enforced these deadlines. Well, wherever you see a deadline referred to in the right to know law, it's for the response, not the actual provision of the records. A lot of agencies think, well, I have to provide these records within the five business days, or I have to provide these records after the 30 calendar days. That's not what the right to know law says. It says you provide the response, not the records. Okay, and there's a difference. So my response might be within five business days, we are granting your request, send us payment, and you detail what the payment is, and when your check clears, we will then provide you with the records, which could be, you know, well outside of the five business days. So the agency is permitted, and, and the right to know law is silent when it comes to how you actually charge for the records and how payment is processed. All the right to know law says is that the records are provided upon payment, meaning that the agency gets the payment first and then they can provide the records. Now, there are some agencies that will uh, partake of an, a mutual exchange, meaning the person comes in, hands them the cash, and then the agency turns around and hands them the records at the same time. And that's fine. You know, you do whatever you want relative to how you charge for the records and how you process the payment and when you provide the records. Usually, once the payment is cleared, uh, admittedly, this is subjective, but within a couple days, then you then you then provide the records and you mail them out or send them electronically or whatever you have to do in order to make sure that you've met your obligation, you know, a reasonable period of time, a couple of days, okay? And then everyone is satisfied as to how it's how that has transpired. Now, there is a provision within the right to know law, section 901, where, um, or I'm sorry, it's section 1307, where if you receive a right to know request, and it is a large response, where the costs are going to exceed $100, the agency can demand prepayment before they begin processing the response. Uh, I like to refer to it as a security deposit. Okay, and it's in there to make sure that agencies don't get stiff with a really big response and then the person doesn't provide payment. This way, you get your check up front. And then when it comes time for actually providing the records, whether it's a little high, a little low, whatever, you settle up on the exact amount, okay? Whether it be a refund or you demand, you know, additional funds uh, given the size of the response, okay? And then, like I said, then you make arrangement for the actual provision of the records, okay? But it, it's, you see the asterisk there. It's only at the agency discretion. You're not required to do it, but the right to know law allows you to do it where it appears the response is going to exceed $100 in cost. All right, moving on. Um, there's a provision called record discard, section 905. All right, it, it's useful in that um, there's a point I wanna make here. In this particular scenario, someone would request records, the agency grants them, their hard copy records. The arrangement is that the person's going to come down to the uh, borough hall or the township building, uh, the school district administration building, whatever, pick up the records and pay for them then. Okay. Well, what if the person never shows up? Under this section of the right to know law, um, the agency is only obligated to hold on to the records for 60 days. After 60 days, if the person doesn't show up, the agency can discard the records. Okay, so that's the point of this section. But more importantly, what I want to emphasize is that there is still an outstanding cost. Okay, the agency did everything it was legally required to do. 
under the right to know law. It's not their fault that the person within two months couldn't come and pick up the records. So what do you do? Well, there's an outstanding cost. So under the right to know law in case law, because there is an outstanding cost with this individual, the agency is not under any obligation to process further right to know requests, not only for the records that were requested, but for any other records that this person must request. Let's say that the original request and the response cost $30. Okay, so you've got this outstanding $30 debt. Well, until that debt is settled, the agency doesn't have to re, re, um, respond to any, well, you have to respond, but you don't have to process any further right to know requests. What you can do is say that uh, there is an outstanding uh, $30 invoice out there that requires payment. And until that request is paid, we are denying your subsequent requests. Okay, so again, going back to those frivolous requesters who aren't willing to pay, if you can come up with a way to assess a fee, and then let's say they balk at that fee, even if it's just a couple dollars, that is an outstanding uh, cost. And until they've settled up on that cost, you don't have to process any further right to know requests from those individuals until they've settled up that debt. Okay. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that it's still a denial. And like I said earlier, disputes over fees can be appealed to our office. So from the agency perspective, what you want to make sure you do is all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Because if it does get appealed, the appeals officer is going to want to see all of the documentation. You know, how did you calculate what the amount is? What communication did you have with the requester so that they were fully aware of how the outstanding fees were calculated? You know, are the fees accurate? Are they legal? And then if in turn the appeals officer agrees with you, then they will issue their final determination saying yes, until the requester settles up on these outstanding fees from the previous requests, um, you don't have to process and the denial is appropriate. Um, there have been instances where uh, it gets appealed all the way up to the courts and the courts have turned around and say, now, wait a minute. We don't like the way the agency uh, calculated these fees or notified the requester. So there are some decisions where the courts have disagreed and they've turned around and said, this is what you have to do and you have to release the records now. Uh, but in the most case, in the most cases, uh, my experience is probably around somewhere between 90 and 95 percent. The Office of Open Records has agreed with the agency on the issue of outstanding fees. Um, and then I just want to finish up by saying there's nothing in the right to know law or case law that addresses collection activities if there are outstanding fees. All I'll say is that there's no statute of limitations. The debt doesn't go away after a month. It doesn't go away after a year. It doesn't go away after five years. And there are some instances where we have requesters with outstanding fees from, you know, five, uh, seven, eight years uh, that are still out there. Uh, so if the agency has, you know, if they have a practice uh, with other processes of turning over outstanding fees to a collection agency or whatever, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you can do that because I've never seen it addressed through the right to know law process. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah, I you kind of gathered this from my my presentation here, no surprises. And the point is that there's nothing in the right to know law that prevents an agency and a requester from talking to each other. 
Um, let's say, and you know, I've kind of I've kind of intimated this. The agency gets a request in, and you do a quick calculation. Okay, the person's requesting these documents in hard copy. Uh, they're requesting a copy of this report that we have. We have to make copies of it. It's going to cost them about thirty dollars. So you either send them an email or pick up the phone and call them and say, okay, I've done this calculation. I think it's gonna run you about 30 bucks. Are you okay with that? Two things are gonna happen. The person is either gonna say, whoa, wait a minute, I misunderstood. I thought the right to know law was free. So I'm, I'm withdrawing my request. Or they're gonna say, yeah, that's reasonable. I kind of expected that. Go ahead and process it. Okay, that way, Everyone's on the same page, and the agency doesn't get stuck making copies that the person's not willing to pay for. Okay, you save yourself. You know, making the copies is one thing, and you know it's it's a nominal fee. We're not nobody gets rich off of making right to know all copies. But what about your time? You know, what about all those man hours that went into it? Okay, there you could save yourselves a lot of time and money because you're not processing a request that ultimately the person is going to balk on. Or let's say that the person, um, when they submit the right to know request, they say, if it's going to exceed $10, give me a call. Okay, that's perfectly legal. And in fact, we recommend when we do training to requesters, we tell them you should do this. Okay, that way, again, no surprises. That communication, what if it's a right to know request where it's not quite as clear as the agency would like, and they're worried that they might make copies of the wrong thing that the person doesn't need. So you have that conversation, okay? Is this what you're asking for? Uh, I think so. Yeah, that's what I want copies of, okay? So, you know, everything's settled. You know what you need to provide. Have that conversation if there's any vagueness um, to prevent these misunderstandings. Now, if you've sat through the session on the basics of the right to know law, you know that you cannot compel a person to tell you why they are submitting a right to know request. You can't deny a request based on the reason or what you think that reason is. Okay, but the law doesn't say you can't ask. And sometimes, it may save everybody a lot of misunderstanding by simply asking, why are you submitting this right to know request? And I'll, I'll give you, you know, a, a somewhat vague example here. Let's say that you have a business owner within the jurisdiction who's having some issues with the IRS. You know, it's tax season, business taxes, whatever. And the IRS is saying, you need to give us a copy of this particular record. All right, but they don't say specifically, you know, we need a record proving something, okay? And the local government, it, chances are they have it. So now you have a business owner with a problem. In order to solve that problem, they need to submit a right to know request to the agency for a record. They're not really sure what the record is, but they're going to submit this right to know request. So they cast a wide net, okay? And they're calculating that when they get the records back, somewhere within those records is going to be that piece of paper that they need to settle their dispute with the IRS. Okay, that's the best they can do based on the vagueness of what the IRS or what maybe their attorney is telling them. Um, but the agency is looking at it from a completely opposite perspective. We don't like wide nets. We want narrow nets so that we can go right to the file cabinet, pull out the record that we need, that's responsive to the request, and get it out of my hair, okay? Minimal work, minimal time, minimal labor, okay? So when you encounter a situation like that, and if you suspect something's going on here, again, my advice to the agency is pick up the phone, have that conversation, and look, you know, sir, I think you, you know, we, we got your right to no request. I'm not sure if you realize how much this is going to cost you based on what you're asking for. Um, do you mind telling me why you're submitting the right to no request? And I might be able to help you out. 
And the guy then starts explaining, well, yeah, the IRS says that I need some proof of what's going on with my business and the uh, locality, uh, the local jurisdiction, so that I can settle this dispute I have with the IRS. And suddenly, you know, you being the subject matter expert, the agency is saying, I know exactly what they're looking for. We deal with this, you know, routinely. I can have that ready for you this afternoon. And it's, you know, maybe it's just one sheet of paper. So suddenly, by them revealing why they're submitting the right to know request, number one, you're solving their problem. Number two, you're, sol you're, you're saving yourselves a lot of work. But, you know, you need to establish that trust that oftentimes doesn't exist between government and the business owner. Uh, so, you know, you need to approach it in a very diplomatic way. You don't demand why are you submitting this right to know request? You kind of say, maybe I can help you out. But, you know, again, that's up to you in how you approach this issue. The point I'm trying to make in my experience, you know, I was a right to know officer here at the Office of Open Records, where we would typically get a thousand right to know requests a year. Occasionally, I would have this conversation and, you know, you know how it works. OK, and um, you want to save everybody as much heartache and work as possible. So you work together. Okay, so, and that's the point I'm trying to make. All right, so moving on. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting near the end of the presentation. Uh, certified records. This is section 1307C of the right to know law. Periodically, people are dealing with litigation and they have to submit records uh, to the court as evidence. So the court is saying, we'll take these records, but we need proof of certification. And under the right to know law, the agency then provides a certification and they can charge $5 to say that these records are certified. But you have to understand what it is you're certifying. The agency is providing copies of the originals. And with those copies, they provide language a document that says, we are certifying that these are true and correct copies of the originals. They have not been altered in any way. What you are not certifying is the provenance, the substance of the records themselves. Uh, it's, and it's not like, um, like a police department and a chain of evidence certification. All you're doing is saying, these are accurate copies of the originals that we have possession of. And um, you can go to our website, go to the Agency Open Records Officer Guidebook, and you'll find sample language in there that you can use for these certifications, okay? That's all that that means when you provide a certified copy. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is transcripts. This comes up every now and then, not that often, but, um, we get questions about it. And it's when someone requests a copy of a transcript for an otherwise public hearing, not a public meeting, but a public hearing. There's usually uh, like zoning or maybe a, a codes issue or whatever. And it's under section 70C. And I'm gonna try and break this down into you know, understandable language here. But um, there's two, there's a two part test that needs to be met for someone to get a transcript through the right to know process. The first is kind of easy to understand because it's an adversarial uh, setting, an adversarial hearing, not a meeting, but a hearing. Uh, it can be usually appeal. And the first part of the test is that all appeals must be exhausted, meaning either the person has decided they're not going to appeal it any further, and all deadlines have been uh, 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 met, meaning they, they've, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the word, but you know they've been exhausted, okay? There's no longer a right to appeal. So that's the first part of the test, pretty simple. But the second part is that the agency must have a copy of the transcript in its possession. And that doesn't always happen. Because let me explain how this usually works. 
Prior to the hearing, the agency will contract with an outside stenographer to come in and there's a set fee, a stenographer fee. And then the stenographer establishes a per page fee that if the agency wants the actual transcript, that they're going to pay X number of dollars per page. Now, if all appeals have been exhausted and there's no need for the agency to have a copy of the transcript, a lot of times they'll only pay the set fee and they won't buy the transcript. OK, they won't worry about it. If that's the case, then the person who wants the transcript, the requester, needs to go to the stenographer and pay the per page fee, which is usually a couple bucks. OK, if, however, the agency has paid for the transcript and they have it in their possession, then the person can get it as a public record and they only have to pay the up to 25 cents a page fee. OK, now, occasionally the stenographer will say, whoa, wait a minute, that's my product. You have to pay me and my per page fee. Our office has said, no, sorry, that's not the case. The agency, because they have it in their possession, it's a public record and the right to know law applies and you're out of luck. The agency already paid you for your product and now it's their property. Okay, hey, one has actually popped up here. Okay, can a requester ask for the printing? Okay, that's the original. Uh, question about that. I'm just going to scroll through here and see if there's any chance other questions have popped up. I'm, I'm sorry. I told you there was an issue earlier about uh, the chat and something just really changed here. OK, I see no other questions have come through that are at least are appearing up on the screen. OK, so hopefully that explains the whole transcript thing. Um, it's confusing language, so people don't always understand. It doesn't come up all that often, but I just want to put it out there for the good of the order since we are talking about payment issues. OK, uh, and that's it for the presentation. Uh, again, if someone tried to submit questions, uh, I apologize. Uh, for whatever reason, this chat feature uh, did not come up uh, on the uh, big screen the way it usually does. Um, but anyway, if you have any further questions, you can try getting them in now. And we'll see if they do pop up. Um, but in the meantime, um, you've heard me refer to our website a number of times. I want to encourage you to take a look at that website for all the resources that are available there. I mentioned the uh, Arrow Handbook, uh, 76 pages that you can download for free, and it has uh, a lot of good information on there. Um, there are guides for citizens, guides for agencies, guides for law enforcement. Uh, uh, everything I've talked about here with uh, the fee schedule, you can find the fee schedule online along with those footnotes that I emphasized and take a look. Um, if you're a real geek about government transparency, uh, you can subscribe to our Twitter feed every morning at eight o'clock. We'll wake you up with a tweet with all the news of the day related to government transparency, decisions that we've issued, uh, court decisions that you might want to take a look at, uh, and just general news on uh, transparency across the country. OK, but I want to thank you for your participation today. Hopefully you've learned something and uh, we'll have our next webinar on in two weeks uh, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to join us then. But uh, get out, enjoy the weather. Uh, summer is on the way and uh, Take care, folks.